This is part four of the series on capitalist externalities and health. I'm David Eagleman, clinical professor, family medicine at Brown University. And this is part three of the talc lecture series. We're going to start with the history of testing for asbestos and talc. Just to summarize quickly, the companies came up with a test method which when used would fail to detect low levels of asbestos and talc. They then went on to claim that those results indicated that the talc was asbestos free, which it wasn't since they knew before they adopted the test method that the level of asbestos was lower than the amount that the test method that they had eventually adopted could find. So this section starts really in 1973 when the FDA first proposed regulating asbestos in cosmetic talc. Uh, the first proposed regulation was that it be at least 99.99% free of chrysotile and 99.9% free of amphibole. That would be tremolite, enthophilite, or actinolite. In general, those are the amphiboles that were found associated with and in uh, commercial cosmetic talcs. Cosmetic talcs, by the way, is a misnomer. The uh, talcs used in cosmetics come from the same mines that we use for industrial purposes. And it was merely a created name uh, in 1976 uh, to allow companies to argue that the talcs that they used were different from ones that had been shown to cause health effects beginning in the 1930s and 40s. Some of those papers were part of the last talk. At any rate, in order to regulate it at a level, the FDA needed to uh, develop a test method or adopt a test, me test method that would be able to find chrysotile at 0.01%. And the test method that was eventually adopted in 1976 but not implemented officially ever, uh, was a method that would not be able to detect tremolite at less than 5%. And it specifically excluded testing for chrysotile asbestos. The companies told the FDA they'd never found chrysotile in any asbestos product, any talc product. That was of course a lie, but nonetheless, since they were allowed to develop their own method, they developed a method and excluded testing for chrysotile from the method. Now, when they first tested the method, they tested the method twice. This is a round robin where uh, samples of positives and negatives were sent to uh, a variety of laboratories, some run by the companies, one run by Mount Sinai. Um, and only one of the seven labs detected 0.5% tremolite in talc. Uh, since that was what the FDA wanted as a level of purity, clearly this test method wouldn't work. And of course, the, uh, the Association of Cosmetic Companies, the CTFA, evaluated the round robin and concluded on their own that the objectives of the test method to determine whether or not any 1976 production of major commercial talc products contain asbestiform amphibole contaminants and test and verify the CTFA method did not provide any assurance that the method was accurate, reliable, and practical or as he reported, and this is all quoted from the document, 
these objectives, that is accuracy, reliability, and practicality, had not been achieved. Nonetheless, this is the method that the companies went on to adopt, and the FDA allowed them to do so. This is an example of how insensitive a method can be. We have two scales here. As you see, the scale on the right is a very sensitive scale, and it finds that the feather is present and can measure a weight. A bathroom scale, on the other hand, registers zero, even though it also has a feather. And if you use the method that uh, CTFA used by analogy, if the scale measures zero, it's interpreted as none detected, which was then interpreted as no asbestos present, which is obviously not true. There's a feather in both places. Uh, they did consider uh, electron microscopy, transmission electron microscopy, which was a much more sensitive method than the X-ray method that they adopted. And they uh, expressed grave concern if TEM was included as an alternative follow-up to op optical microscopy. In this test method that they adopted, it was x-rayed first, and if it was positive for x-ray, you'd have to find fibers under a light microscope. One suggestion was that the more sensitive method would be to use electron microscopes to test if it was positive initially with x-ray diffraction. And that was a great concern because it was too sensitive. And J&J &J stressed at the meetings that the danger of being tied to a more sensitive methodology may, be, may evolve in the future. And they wanted, therefore, for the CTFA to adopt a less sensitive method soon. And they again considered electron microscopy, it said it was not available to most talc users, although some companies did have electron microscopes. And J and J complained that it was this is J and J memo. It was ultra sensitive, and therefore could be a problem because it would find asbestos in the talc when it was not. When when the other method would not find it. Uh, J and J results were specified to be reported as none detected or non detected but intentionally left out the level that could be detected, which was 0.5%. CTFA members did this intentionally mislead customers uh, and the FDA into believing that none detected equaled asbestos free. J&J uh, recognized the, in, the misleading nature of reporting non-detect without putting in the level of detection. Um, they pleaded with the CTFA to, this is a quote from the document, to include the actual limit. Uh, the uh, Pfizer corporate company didn't attend the meeting, but later on they were part of the CTFA and they wrote, they quote, I particularly object to the section at the end that reads containing no detectable asbestos minerals. The reason for my objections are obvious. They do not specify the detection level nor the de detection method. I feel this can lead to some very serious breaks in communication between the buyer and the seller, i.e. the buyers would be misled into believing the talc was asbestos free when it wasn't. Again, another meeting, non-detected does not mean asbestos free. Uh, the people in the CTFA, which is a Cosmetic Toiletry and Fragrance Association, at this meeting overrode J&J's objections and used the term non-detected without the maximum limit against the recommendation offered by Johnson & Johnson. Again, J4-1 did not test for Chrysotile intentionally. In March 
1976 in an effort to get the FDA to withdraw their proposed regulation. Several companies <clears throat> had the CTFA send false information to the FDA claiming that they had tested their talcs and found them to be asbestos free. Colgate Palmolive had a positive test in 1971 and just prior to sending the letter to the FDA, they typed in that the results were contaminated. So in 1976, they determined without any further testing that the 1971 test was contamination. J&J &J played it cute with the dates. They had positive tests before and after December 72 and October 73, but limited the reports to the FDA to the tests done between those two dates, which were negative. McCrone had found testing to be positive. They'd done testing for a variety of companies. They were a testing company. Cypress Minerals had also had positive tests. And Whitaker, Clack, and Daniels, those are companies that supplied talc to the cosmetic talc manufacturers. <clears throat> this is the J&J &J letter where they, uh, in a very uh, fancy footwork, to claim that uh, their asbestos, their talc was asbestos free, because during these dates, which they specified, they didn't find any asbestos. Okay. And McCrone also played it cute, saying that since 1973, none of the talcs had shown any detectable levels of either chrysotile or asbestiform amphibole. But of course, before 1973, they had found chrysotile and tremolite. Johnson & Johnson forwarded this letter to the FDA twice, once in 1972, where they claimed that these five laboratories had tested uh, the Johnson talcs and not found any uh, asbestos. They were using this to rebut Johnson, the FDA Lewin tests initially, but they also resubmitted these reports or this letter to the FDA in 1976. Of course, these, this wasn't true for two reasons. First, uh, Pooley had found uh, asbestos in J&J &J talc, and I'm going to show you that a little later. Secondly, McCrone had found it, but J&J &J had altered the report. I went over that last time. And the Dartmouth uh, University researchers had found asbestos in J&J &J talc using a concentration method these are actual test results, finding asbestos in J&J &J talc, which were never produced or given to the FDA. And they go to 1974 here. There were also tests later on after the letter was sent to the FDA. These are some of them from 1984 on. None of these were given to the FDA either. Now, the FDA wasn't fooled. Uh, and they, the head of the cosmetics division, Dr. Ironman, this is his signature on this memo. The memo is a poor copy, so I've retyped it here. Um, this is what he wrote after reviewing the results supplied to him by the companies. In summary, though the submission by the CTFA talc subcommittee looks impressive at first hand, it does not offer much assurance that cosmetic talcs are adequately tested for asbestos. We have not much choice but to move ahead as speedily as possible with a proposed proposal of a regulation on asbestos and talc using XRD and another method. Um, based on the levels of adulteration of talc with asbestos fibers on the level of sensitivity provided by these methods. They never issued those regulations. 
they allow the uh, companies to use this J4-1 method to claim that their talcs were asbestos free. Again, this method can't detect tremolite and there was no test for chrysotile. Let's look at that chrysotile assertion that they've never found chrysotile. These are just tests on J and J uh, talcs, all of which found chrysotile, none of which were provided to the FDA. This is a particularly good test done by Hutchinson by electron microscopy, and he had very nice pictures of chrysotile in his report, which j, &J got in September of 1972, four years before they told the FDA their tests were negative. And of course, this fell within the October to December 73 gap year. So they're not technically lying, but certainly it was misleading to not give the FDA these results and assert that they'd never found chrysotile in their talcs. This is Langer's memo, which I went over before. This is, I'm sorry, this is J&J's memo. I'm meeting with Langer, where Langer showed them in his lab chrysotile and baby powder. These are some J&J uh, results by Macron, which also lied to the FDA about never finding asbestos in talcs or chrysotile in talcs. Now let's look at an alternative method, which was available to J&J &J in the early 70s. Okay, first, it's impossible to test every talc product. Uh, you only do 100 nanograms per every test. It would take 15,000 years to test one gram. And that's a, this is a, one gram would be a small travel size package of Johnson's baby powder, not this big, you know, 12 inch can. It would take 600,000 years to test a whole bottle based on J&J's test frequency. So that's obviously not practical, okay? And this was recognized, the Colorado School of Mines in a report to Johnson & Johnson said as the impurity level becomes less than 1%, it's necessary to examine larger amounts of a sample, sample to detect the impurity. As a result, the requirement to detect the proverbial needle in a haystack, they have evolved a procedure which pre-concentrates the impurities prior to examination. So the analogy would be, very difficult to find a needle in a haystack, but if you burnt the hay off and tested what was left, you could use a magnet, you could find the needles. And essentially, that's what the concentration method was. But instead of burning it, they spun it. The asbestos came to the, to the uh, uh, top, and they would look at the top and they would find the asbestos by concentrating the test. This is a test that Pooley used the concentration method and found asbestos in Vermont talc. Remember, Pooley was one of the people that J&J &J told the FDA in 76 that he'd never found, uh, they never found asbestos in their talc, not true. This is from the uh, Dartmouth test results showing uh, actinolite fibers. That's an amphibole. And these are bundles, so these are definitely fibers and not rocks. And also was fibrous talc. The quality of this um, document is not good. Unlike Hutchinson, it was not a, a very well copied document. Uh, j, j itself tried the Dartmouth method and found tremolite in Vermont talc. So they repeated it, and they found as little as 0.01% tremolite in Vermont talc. Okay. 
Again, the FDA asked for information on concentration methods. J&J didn't provide any. They were aware of the proposal. They found it disturbing because it aims at separation, isolation of asbestos from a wide scope of products in emerald tissues. Our main problems have had to do with identification, whereas now it looks like the FDA is getting into separation isolation methodology, which will mean concentration procedures. This was a bigger problem for J&J than just uh, electron microscopy, because with concentration, uh, the tester could find very low levels of asbestos. And since there was no safe level of asbestos, as admitted by J&J &J, and as recognized by most of the researchers during this time period, any asbestos meant it was a cancer hazard and really shouldn't be sold. Okay, and they recognize that many talcs in all markets would be hard pressed to support purity claims when ultra sophisticated assays, separation, isolation techniques are applied. That's concentration and electron microscopy. They felt that the FDA proposal would open up a new problem areas with asbestos and talc minerals. But thankfully, J&J &J never told the FDA what they knew about concentration methods and FDA never adopted them. Of course, they never adopted any test methods. They gave the companies the ability to test, to choose their own test methods. The first published paper on concentration methods was done by Alice Blount, who was a consultant to Johnson & Johnson, although she did this work on her own. She found needles and fiber in Johnson & Johnson's Vermont talcs and in their final product. Uh, she was contacted by Johnson & Johnson lawyers and told them that Johnson's Vermont talc contains trace amounts of asbestos. This was never given to the FDA by J&J. Let's look at some test results, findings of J&J in, in, um, by J&J or its lab, Walter McCrone. I gave you charts of these before. These are some of the more detailed test results showing that there were confirmed asbestos visually, which meant it was definitely fibers of asbestos, not rocks. Here's another one <clears throat> where they found it in the ore and in the product. And again, they're finding chrysotile because they're using different methods than the J4-1 method. And in fact, Cyprus, which bought the mine from J&J, &J, found asbestos to be ubiquitous, that is found everywhere. Tremolite and actinolite are ubiquitous in several zones of the Vermont mines. The potential problems involved with fiber and dumps and to some degree in products must be carefully evaluated. This is before they bought the mine. They went on to buy the mines anyways. Again, they wrote about uh, impurities, specifically asbestos impurities, and it was impossible to get rid of actinolite, which is an asbestos from the talc. This is a study in 2017 by Ilgren, who found tremolite fibers in talc products made in 1970s, early 1970s. He found an unopened can along with the mine owner, Carlo Santoro, and he found tremolite in the Italian talc which was used by Cashman Bouquet, Johnson & Johnson, and a variety of other cosmetic talc manufacturers. It was felt to be one of the better talcs because it was softer. Now, of course, there were many non-detects. There were about three or 400 tests using J4-1 of Johnson & Johnson's product where it was not found just to give you the whole story here. But J&J &J 
also modify the J4-1, well, actually the, the electron microscopy method, despite the fact that it wasn't required. J&J &J did do electron microscopy on some samples. However, they found they if they found a single fiber, they would say it was a non-quantifiable test result, basically negative. They required that you find five fibers of each particular type before the test would be called positive. So you could have 16 fibers and it would be negative since there are five different types of asbestos. Also, uh, the talc supplier was shipping talc before they tested it. This is a frantic email in 2004 because it, 2001 samples had been found to have talc in them, asbestos in the talc. And for a four-year period, uh, Julie Pierre of Luzanac, the talc supplier, had fallen behind and not tested the talcs at all. So this is John Hopkins, again, Johnson & Johnson's corporate representative. He speaks for the company. The talc is sold first, and then the TEM the electron microscopy is done on the composites, which are, means they would take a small amount from various production runs. Uh, you get a positive on a composite. It's nothing you can do. The talc's already been sold. And that concludes this section of the talk on talc and asbestos.